All right, how's my audio? Sounds good. All right, and you can see my screen? Hey, firm. All right, very good. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Chris, AE5IT. Uh, I'm gonna be presenting today on kind of an ongoing on again, off again project I've been working on for a while, uh, slot antennas. Uh, let me put this in presentation mode. There we go. All right. So um, I was originally licensed as KD0's UIF in 2014. Uh, my interest in ham at the time was just, I want to be able to call for help in the mountains uh, where cell phones don't work. Um, but immediately I became this, you know, I became an RF nerd. I fell in love with uh, a new area of electronics that I'd never messed with before. Uh, weird antennas started getting my, my attention. Um, some of you will have seen my presentation on trans, uh, transmission lines. Like that's the kind of nerdy stuff that just got me going. Um, slot antennas were one of those things very early on. Uh, I kind of fell in love with slot antennas when I found out about them. There, I didn't have any application for them, but I always wanted one. So fast forward a little bit. Um, Late 2019, I got a car that I wanted to put radios in. I didn't really want to drill for antennas. Uh, I don't like mag mounts. Uh, I don't like lip mounts for trunks. So uh, I was looking at what my other options might be. And I thought, what if I use a slot antenna? What if I, I have these body panels? There are gaps between body panels as a door opens and closes or a hood or whatever. Uh, if I can load the gap across some of these body panels to use a slot antenna, uh, and then I'm not having to drill, then maybe I'm just running cables through a, a gasket on the trunk or something, um, which leads to some of the challenges. Uh, construction uh, waterproofing was kind of a problem, uh, especially with my particular car, just the way all the gaskets and gutters lined up, like it was always going to leak uh, without doing a lot of uh, creative work. Um, the construction of the antenna itself. Um, I was working without a VNA. I didn't have any way to measure uh, electronically what I was doing. I did own a VNA, but it was kind of messed up. So uh, I was just kind of working from books and doing my best guess and just seeing what happened. Lots of guesswork. Um, getting it to radiate well, getting it to match to a radio to 50 ohm was surprisingly difficult. I was not having a lot of success with uh, what the books told me to expect. Um, and I also found that the radiation pattern was very far from ideal. Some of that was expected. Uh, it was uh, just a little more weird than I thought it would be. And of course, the polarization. Um, a lot, because slot antennas are not very common in the ham world, a lot of the literature on them is extremely academic. And I don't have the background to follow a lot of that. So I had thought as I was reading through that I understand what the polarization would look like. Um, and I wasn't sure it would be great for what I was trying to do. Turns out that was the case. Uh, polarization on these, just the way that it was arranged on the vehicle, it, it wasn't really like, I, I was way, way down from what you'd expect from a vertical, uh, like a whip or something on the car. Um, the, the polarization would have been kind of theoretically good for, you know, directly overhead ISS passes, but that's how often is that happening? Uh, how often are you operating ISS from your car exclusively? Uh, and I made it harder on myself by going, trying to build a slot antenna that was dual band, uh, that would radiate well for both two meters and 70 centimeters at the same time. Uh, I still think that could work, but I bit off like the hardest possible version of this project. Uh, lesson learned, don't do that. Start simple. Um, here's a photo of uh, that initial build. So this particular car has a gap between body panels. And I'm going to try to illustrate. I have a little toy car here that I've marked up similarly to what you're seeing in the photo. Um, there's a gap in body panels on the roof, just centered right in the roof. And I took some six inch wide aluminum foil tape and ran it down either side of those that gap in the body panels and then short it out on the ends. So you can kind of see that here on this toy car, just uh, two conductive strips 
parallel with a little gap between them and then short it on the ends. And uh, soldered a little bit of coax as a feed point. And, uh, and then just ran this long piece of cable down into the trunk uh, where I had the radios mounted. Actually, the radios were flopping around loose. Never got around to mounting because this didn't really work all that well. Um, so you can see the aluminum tape. I've got some copper tape adhered to that and then I soldered to the copper, not necessarily in that order, um, trying to keep heat off the, uh, the car itself. And uh, loaded this up. Uh, borrowed a VNA after a few days, and uh, yeah, this is not what you want to see. You don't really want to see. Sure, this is close to a one-to-one -one SWR, uh, but across what is that, 80 megahertz? Something's wrong. This this was kind of a dummy load, and uh, I even saw that at the time with uh, signal strength uh, that I was I was way down even from a handheld radio in the car, so. You put, it, you put an antenna on the outside of a car to get better uh, signal, and it wasn't paying off. Um, so that was February of 2020. Oh yeah, waterproofing. Um, I, I drove down to Albuquerque to present on uh, my early exper experiments with this antenna uh, and drove home through a wicked ice storm. Uh, the whole car loaded up in just this, <laughs> inch thick layer of ice all over. Uh, this was not very good for the antenna, even though I had, after this photo was taken, I did put down a big sheet of uh, black vinyl to cover it up for a little bit of waterproofing and uh, to keep the wind from tearing it apart. Um, it wasn't quite enough. This was a mess. So uh, that was early 2020. What happened in 2020? <laughs> a lot of things happened in 2020. Um, not only the obvious COVID thing, but you know, my dad got sick. So like suddenly my attention was elsewhere. I put this down. I did not come back to it until about a week ago. Um, so Willem asked me uh, to pick this up or, or maybe I offered, I don't even remember. But anyway, uh, about a week ago, picked this back up and it had been like tickling my attention. I'd, I'd been wanting to return to it, not necessarily for the vehicle application, but just because like I love slot antennas. I keep thinking about them. And over the last year, year and a half, there's actually been a lot of attention to slot antennas. Uh, several articles on QST, um, the QSO Ham Fest, Ham Expo last year had a slot, radio, a slot antenna presentation. Uh, Ham, radio, uh, Ham Radio Workbench, their uh, mini Ham Fest a couple of weeks ago uh, had a slot presentation. Um, this is sort of getting out in the air again. and. Uh, so like it had my attention. I, I also think that uh, some of the uh, some of the designs that are being talked about today, uh, I I don't know. They're they they're, they're kind of odd, and so I want to kind of work on those and, and see if they're working the way that uh, it's advertised. Because uh, I'm not entirely convinced. But okay, so what is a slot antenna? I've been talking around what they are. Let's talk about what they are. Uh, it is literally, you take a big sheet of metal and you cut a slot into it. So imagine this little scrap of drywall here. Imagine this is just a big aluminum plate. I'm not, use, I'm not showing you a big aluminum plate because they're reflective and that makes them very hard to film. So the scrap of drywall, if you just take a saw and you just plunge cut and go whatever length you need to go, pull the saw back out, you've made a slot. If you then take a piece of coax or parallel transmission line, whatever, and you connect one lead, one side of your coax to either side of this gap, you have made a slot antenna. So a slot antenna mathematically has a lot in common with the dipole that we think about, that we build all the time. The, if I hold these up next to each other, you may even see they're very similar in length. The math works out, the math works out very similarly on these antennas. The construction works out very similarly on them between a dipole and a slot. Um, you need the, they'll resonate 
given the same dimensions, they'll resonate at about the same frequency. Uh, they will have very similar radiation patterns with an important caveat. When you have a vertical dipole, you have your radiation donut coming out this way in all directions. Great. Omnidirectional, that's great for putting on top of a car. It's great for putting on a roof. You don't have to steer it. Fantastic. You also have vertical polarization on a vertical dipole. Here's the big caveat. A vertical slot, right? Here's our slot that we build into our aluminum sheet. A vertical slot still is omnidirectional. Your radiation donut is coming out like this. You can put it on your roof. You can radiate 360 degrees in azimuth, but your polarization is horizontal, which means theoretically you're 20 dB down on any vertical width, any other vertical width out there, you're presumably about 20 dB down. Um, so you can get your vertical polarization to talk to people on their handhelds with a horizontal slot, but now you're directional because your donut is going this way, right? So you're sending some signal down to the ground, you're sending some signal up to the sky, and you're sending signal directly out this way and directly behind you. So you just turned your donut on its side. So that can be great. There can be scenarios where you'll want a beam that you can like point in one direction, but anybody off on the side, you're not going to, you're going to be way down trying to talk to them. So maybe not great on a car um, <clears throat> because you want to be able to talk to everyone, not just the people who are like ahead of you and behind you on the road. Uh, there's also a funny thing with uh, the, the feed point impedance. When you feed a dipole in the center, you are at about 75 ohms, and that's close enough to 50 ohm cable that you don't really have to, you, in most cases, you don't really have to worry about any kind of transformation or matching. If you feed a slot in the middle, your feed point impedance is about 500 ohms. So it's about a 10 to one mismatch. So you either need some kind of transformer and finding transformers that work at VHF and UHF at that, at that particular value or is difficult, or you can move your feed point. Instead of feeding in the center, you can start coming out towards one end. And if you play around, move your feed point back and forth, you'll find a spot right about here, usually, that is uh, a 50 ohm. You can, you can just directly put a 50 ohm feed point right there. Um, takes a little fiddling, but uh, you can find that spot. Whereas if you fed a dipole towards the end, you know, you, there's your 500 ohms or whatever. You get something, you get some weird value. So why would you use a slot antenna? First of all, they're neat. That's my reason for using one. Uh, they do become very practical at VHF and UHF uh, into the microwave. They're common in aviation. Uh, you think of an airplane, it's got aluminum skin. Uh, you can like mill a little slot into the leading edge of a wing or somewhere on the body. And then you put like a non, you just put a fiberglass or something cover over that so you don't have a hole in your wing. Uh, well, that slot that you cut into the aluminum can be an antenna. And now you don't have to have a wire flapping around messing up your aerodynamics. Uh, it's common in TV broadcast. Be TV signals are horizontally polarized, but your broadcast tower, you want to blanket a signal out in all directions, usually. So having something that is omnidirectional in azimuth and horizontally polarized, that's a great use case for slot antennas, TV broadcast. Uh, telecom, uh, they get used for cell towers and microwave arrays. It is very easy to make uh, directional microwave array arrays using just a big sheet of metal with slots spaced all over it. Uh, those, those arrays can be electrically steerable just by adjusting how you're feeding all of those slots, you can have your signal move back and forth just in electronics. You don't have to move your dish at all. Um, that metal plane that you've milled slots into, that could be a waveguide. And now you have a structural member that is also your antenna and is electrically steerable and gives you gain in some direction, uh, depending on how you've built your slots. So you have a uh, 
you'll see these on cell towers, right? If you have that panel, that might be a bunch of patches. It might be a piece of weighted guide with slots in it. Uh, all these different models are out there. Uh, slots are largely unknown by hams until like the last year or so, which is interesting. Uh, slot antennas are completely impractical at HF because of the sizes that you need. Uh, your, the math works best if your metal sheet is infinitely large, infinitely tall, infinitely long. Well, we don't have that. The, the math works pretty well. It's a close approximation if your metal sheet is about a wavelength long and about half a wavelength tall relative to your slot. Um, so, okay, at UHF, we can, have, we can have a piece of metal this big for 70 centimeters. It's, it's gonna catch the wind. Maybe we don't wanna put it on our roof, maybe, but maybe we have like a piece of house siding on your, your, uh, your shack that you can just mill a slot into. And maybe there's some use case where that works for you. Or, you know, you're looking at, a, if you're working in the microwave, you've got a piece of waveguide you can mill slots into. There are these scenarios where that does make a lot of sense. And you've got enough metal to work with relative to your wavelength for it to be practical. But at HF, you're not going to have, how are you going to do a 40 meter slot, right? Uh, you're going to have a piece of aluminum foil on your roof that's 40 meters long and 20 meters high. You're probably not going to do that. Uh, this is, that's why we use wires, right? Um, working in the microwave. You see these some among hams, but mostly hams will use horns or dishes because you get more gain, uh, more directionality in a smaller package. You'll even use a horn to feed a dish instead of having you know, a big piece of waveguide or whatever that's awkward and tall. And uh, I can imagine some use cases for weak signal work where you are horizontally polarized um, and you want something omnidirectional. That's that's one of the challenges of uh, like VHF and UHF uh, sideband is how do you get an omnidirectional signal that's not cross polarized to everyone you're trying to talk to. Um, what some of the articles that have come out in recent years on slot antennas for hams involved stealth antennas, where you're in a uh, you're in a restrictive neighborhood where you can't have obvious antennas up. So maybe you do mill a slot into the aluminum siding on your house. Uh, one guy, John Fortune, uh, W6NBC, took a direct TV dish and, and a jigsaw and cut a slot right into the dish and put a piece of coax across the slot. And in his neighborhood, he's allowed to have satellite TV dishes. It doesn't point at any satellites, it, you know, points at where the repeaters are. Um, nobody's complained and he's in a Pretty restrictive neighborhood. Um, hey, Chris. Some of the yes, sir. You, you know where slots are very, very common on VHF UHF is microwave for a beacon antenna. You can take a piece of waveguide, machine some slots in it, create what's called an Alford slot, and now you have an omnidirectional antenna yeah. for your 10 gigahertz beacon, and everybody can hear it. So very common and very useful. At 10 gig, note uh, note how high that frequency is, right? So think of how small your wavelength is at 10 gig. So something, so your sizes become very practical. Alford slots are something I really want to play with. Those are those are quite neat. Um, one day, one day. Um, some of the other designs that have been published uh, recently seem to contradict the literature, or maybe I'm just misunderstanding either the design or the literature itself. Um, but like it's it's really got me scratching uh, my head on how these some of these designs work, how well they work, if they're actually slot antennas or if they're just getting called the wrong thing. Um, so I want to I want to play with those uh, and just see how it uh, how it all matches up. Okay, so current work. Um, I'm revisiting the fundamentals because again, I tried to bite off way too much last year. I made tried to build an antenna that was way too complicated. I had a use case that was pretty niche. Um, so just starting simple now, uh, I'm going to build from reference designs. So the Krauss antenna Bible, uh, the antenna engineer's handbook by Johnson and Jason, edited by Johnson and Jason, um, just some of the designs that are published, match those, put them on the VNA and just make sure that at every step of the way, I'm getting the performance that I expect, uh, continue figuring out my very weird VNA vector network analyzer, um, it's great, I think, electrically. It's a great little device. The software with it is 
janky. It is some weird, weird software. Uh, it does, it keeps like deciding not to be calibrated anymore. Um, trying to figure out what's going on with that. Uh, I spent a lot of time with it yesterday, <laughs> uh, trying to get some of the data uh, to make sense at all. Um, and then, yeah, I want to work on these replication studies. So take some of these designs that have been published lately, build them and measure their performance. Uh, a lot of what's been published has just been models and possibly misapplied models. Um, one of the challenges with slot antennas is that uh, the free antenna modeling project programs and even some of the paid ones don't handle slots very well. Conveniently, they are sort of, they do have this sort of reciprocal relationship with dipoles. So you can model kind of the complementary dipole and just know that, uh, and, and you'll get a lot of information about that dipole and a lot of that information will transfer over to the slot. You'll just have to know a few things like your impedance will change and you can kind of get a sense of like, roughly what that'll be in advance. And then you can like fine tune it with, experimentally. Um, knowing that your polarization will change. Uh, you, if you just know those things going in, you can model the complementary dipole and just, it'll be pretty close. Let's see, so, okay, enough talking. Let's actually build. So the, uh, one of the designs that's out there is just using a piece of wire uh, and feeding across the, uh, it's, you can see it's in this photo here, although it's quite small, maybe it doesn't come out very well, but you take a loop of wire and instead of feeding it the way we would think of a loop where you just break it at some point and you feed the two ends, instead you have a continuous loop of wire and you feed across this gap between the parallel pieces. So you can see here, if you look at my mouse pointer, which I think you should be able to see, here's a piece of coax coming up. The shield is soldered to one wire, one side of the wire. And then across this gap, the center piece, center pin is soldered over here. Um, and then down here, we have sort of the textbook practical slot antenna where you have this big sheet of aluminum you cut a slot into it and you feed across that gap. And again, you, uh, aluminum just to get the bulk of the sheet. And then I've got conductive copper tape glued to that with conductive glue so I can solder to it. And you can see I've got two different feed points here um, from different times in the, the build session. So these, these didn't, didn't perform like I expected. Got nothing cl even close to what the textbooks said they should do. Uh, on my measurements. Turns out, again, it was my, at least in part, it was my weird VNA deciding that it just didn't want to be calibrated anymore. And I'm talking about from like, I'll be using it, it'll be behaving, and then five minutes later, it's just not calibrated. Reset it, it this whole cycle just repeats all night long. Last night, um, was having these problems. Um, and if you look at these Smith chart plots here, none of these should look like this. Uh, these are all just crazy mismatches, and we've got resonant wire center fed, res resonant wire fed near the end, uh, an open, um, different quantities of metal in the antenna. These these plots all look the same, and they, they should be very different. So is uh, some combination of my VNA misbehaving, the fact that when it was calibrated, it was calibrated for a device under test to be right here at the port but I was actually attaching the antenna through a meter and a half of RG58. And uh, if you remember my other talk on transmission lines, transmission lines are impedance transformers. I didn't think it would matter that much for what I was doing. Turns out it did. So these were all basically appearing uh, due to the, the weird transformation, uh, impedance transformations happening in the cable and then the loss in the cable. These were all just showing up as opens. So that took some time to figure out. I did eventually get that figured out and started getting some some more reasonable measurements from the same changing, nothing on the antennas. Measurements started making a little more sense. Um, so feeding in the center, you expect about a 10 to one SWR. I was getting 12 to one. So like, okay, getting cl closer to what uh, I would expect. Um, trying to find that 50 ohm feed point. Here, I had a little, I had a pretty good disappointment um, trying to feed at the 20th of a wave length feed point, 
that's about where your 50 ohm feed point should be You're looking for a one-to-one -one SWR at that point. But I was actually getting closer to 40 over one. Went back to the previous configuration just to make sure that I hadn't jumped out of calibration again, got the same values. So this was not a calibration issue. Um, something's off in the construction. You've got to figure that out. And that's why we start simple. So there's one variable to work with. Um, and so I moved the feed point a little bit, just trying to like seek experimentally play around and find where that 50 ohm feed point was. And it just wasn't getting any better. Um, so at some point I uh, had to move on and just, uh, oh yeah, I built a dipole just right there, right here in the lab. Just like, okay, I'm just gonna build a, uh, just a boring old dipole that I can connect and make sure it behaves the way I think it will. And sure enough, it did, I got what I expected. I got a, about a 1.5 to one SWA uh, on a resonant dipole. And, SWR, huh, anyway, uh, got about a one to one, one to 1 1.5 to one. Uh, so at least like, I'm not totally off base. My VNA isn't totally misbehaving. I haven't forgotten how to solder any of those things. So something's up with my slot. It's not behaving like I expect. And I've just got to start eliminating probable causes until I find out what's up with it. Um, at this point, I think it might be that my, the slot that I milled is too wide, but we'll see. Um, so, okay, forget about the test equipment. Let's put it on the air and let's see if it will receive and will it transmit reasonably. So, reference, rubber duck, okay? We've got this signal level, level here. And this was on the lookout local repeater here in town. Um, so, rubber duck. Okay, great, we've got this signal level. Go to a center fed dipole. And it's, it's six dB worse, which is not what I expected, but I also had more cable and all that stuff. So maybe that accounts for a lot of it. Um, the, uh, okay, so we get to the, the test slot antenna, finally. Uh, center fed, which should give me about a 10 to one SWR and we measured 12 to one. I was down about four dB from a rubber duck. I'm like, okay, that's performance I can live with for, for you know, early on, that's encouraging. Moved over to that, uh, what should have been a 50, what I expected to be a 50 ohm feed point, but was not. And you can see we immediately go down another 20 dB. Um, so that's going to be lost from the mismatch and the reflections in the cable, losing 20 dB just from moving the feed point. Um, and then that, uh, that other feed point that I tried actually weirdly got a little bit better, um, but, uh, Again, this is, this is a single sample at, uh, at each uh, configuration. So there's gonna be noise in this data. Like is, can we even call it data? There's, there's plenty of work to be done. It was also four degrees outside and dark last night. So I called this good enough for now. Um, so some lessons learned. Uh, don't abandon a project for an entire year and expect to just jump right into it uh, the day before the presentation. And, uh, and have a lot of success. It was, it was kind of a frustrating day, uh, especially since I agreed to give this talk and started a new job on the same day. So I uh, have not had time over the last couple of weeks to really work on this. Uh, so it took a half day yesterday and uh, did some work on this. Uh, relearn my equipment. This, this weird, weird VNA and it's weird, weird software uh, took a lot more uh, relearning than I had expected having not touched it, uh, that particular unit in about three years. Uh, don't make things too hard on yourself. Start simple first, work on one variable at a time, build, the verif build and verify the basics first, and ultimately RF is fun, keep doing it. Uh, RF is a lot of fun, slot and sentence are a lot of fun. Uh, I believe that is gonna be the end. Yeah, I forgot to put a references slide on this um, with uh, some of the literature I've been working with. Um, I will add that slide and re-upload so if, it, if everyone wants to check back on the Indigo site uh, a little bit later, that should be there. Uh, and all right, gonna open it up for questions now.